Christmas, so it's the first call of 2019. Um, so let me share my slides and we'll get things started. Um, there were uh, two things that we wanted to do today. Um, first, I was just going to give another uh, brief update on the work on the activity list, some of which has been happening in parallel to these calls just so that you're all aware of what, uh, what work is ongoing there. Um, and then uh, Nick has been leading on getting the, um, all of the feedback that we've had over the last couple of months on the booking spec actually into the public documentation. Uh, so moving it from Google Docs into the, the public spec. So um, he's done a good chunk of that work and so wants to take uh, you all through some of that this afternoon. Um, and then if you get time at the end, we can cover anything else that, any, that you want to raise, uh, including some of the content for the next calls. Um, so uh, jumping straight in, uh, feel free to ask questions as, as we go. I think you're all uh, pretty much familiar with the process here. Um, so on the activity list, um, where we've got to um, after uh, having uh, meetings with various people across the community at the end of last year. We now have a um, editorial interface set up to help uh, people manage the activity list. Um, so that's at the URL you can see at the screen, activitylisteditor.openactive.io, uh, which I'll just bring up. So this is using an off-the-shelf um, editor for um, scores vocabularies. So because we, use, we, we based our activity list standard on that, um, that existing standard, it meant that there were some tools that we could use. So in the, in the website, you can search for terms. Uh, you can search for individual terms. Um, you can click through to terms and get the um, uh, preferred labels, alternative labels, definitions, etc. when they're in there. Um, you can also see the entire um, list, so there is a hierarchical navigation, so you can see how the list hangs together. Um, the intention is that this is not the place that you would really uh, build, uh, build software against, it's just an editorial tool, but it's a handy place to go just to double check um, what, uh, what terms are in the current version of the vocabulary, check any definitions and relationships. Um, so what we started to do is, um, go back to the slides, there's a couple of bits of technical work and some content work still to be done. Um, so what I'm planning to do is to script up a regular export of the data from that tool so it's published somewhere that's easier for people to um, integrate into their applications so they don't have to try and extract it from here. So most of that work's been done, I just need to script up the export. Uh, and then there's a bit of content work to be done, um, partly just recruiting the final, well, the initial rather editorial board. Um, so uh, uh, Jade Molden has volunteered to help uh, uh, be one of the first editors and coordinate some of that work. Um, but we're, we're looking to recruit some other people, just a small group initially, just to take a kind of active role in ma uh, managing the list. There's a bit of content work to be done. Um, what's in the site at the moment is based on um, the, the revised list that Jade and others put together uh, last year. Um, but I know that they've got some pending changes. Um, and the key thing that's missing is the collections, uh, which provide some useful grouping of the, the activities for different audiences. So those still need to go in, but um, it's re gonna be relatively quick to do that now that we have a tool. Um, the other thing that we've got planned around this is to do um, uh, set up some processes to allow other people to feed into the maintenance of the list. Um, so we've created a set of Google Forms. They need a bit of uh, tweaking and review, but we've got forms for people to provide feedback on the, the kind of on the list as a whole, whether there's kind of big structural uh, changes that they want to recommend, but also suggest new terms. Uh, and revise existing terms. Um, so just give you an example here, just a very simple form um, what, uh, where you can just fill in what's the new term that you think you want to go in the list, what's the definition, just answer some uh, basic questions that would help the editorial team 
then um, uh, incorporate that into the list. Uh, so the, that team will be just kind of taking on this feedback from the community. The idea is that this should all be an open process. So all of the submissions that come through these various forms will go into some public spreadsheets so everyone can see what's currently pending, what's being discussed. So there's some transparency around that. Um, now that we've got those forms, we're planning to do a bit of outreach to uh, say some of the NGBs, et cetera, who are likely to have interest in sections of the activity list, ask them to look at the editorial site, uh, have a browse through it and see if they've got any suggestions or amendments that they would like the editorial team to do uh, and then hopefully feed that bit back through the, uh, the existing forms. Um, so that's where we are with that. Um, the kind of current plan is that that will uh, happen um, uh, as a separate group rather than through these calls ongoing. Um, if there's anything uh, that needs to be changed around you know, the core standards or the way that we're publishing it as open data for people to use, then we'd probably have that discussion here, but detailed discussion on, you know, the definition of football or where various activities should sit in the overall list will happen within that editorial team. Um, we're still kind of working out what will be best for that team, how they um, decide to coordinate, because um, they're all obviously going to be contributing time um, so whether they decide to have regular calls or just coordinate through a mailing list is something that's still up for discussion. But yeah, so that's, that's where we are with that. Um, has anyone got any questions? Yeah, sorry, I, I've certainly um, uh, got, a, got an, an item to have a look at a few of the sports we deal with a lot with, uh, the more traditional pitch and court sports. Who do I speak to about that at the moment? Um, uh, is there a go-to person before that's been set up? Um, well, I, I'm happy if you want to send uh, feedback. I would suggest uh, maybe Tara in the Open Active team. Yeah. Um, it would be a good place to send comments in. But actually, if you want to be a guinea pig for the forms, just uh, try using them. That would be uh, a good test of the process. Sure. So when I circulate the slides after the call, you'll have those and you can just like yeah. try them out. Thank you. I'll do that. Thank you. Um, any other comments or questions? Do people think this is a reasonable approach? Yeah, sounds good to me. I guess my only question or comment will be, um, when is that, I guess, to be decided to some, to some extent because um, that group of editors hasn't been pulled together, but um, what's the plan, the next steps for that kind of process in terms of setting up the group of editors, et cetera? How do we join those calls? If we want to. Um, I'd say that's uh, still still to be decided. So I've had a, a quick chat with uh, Tara because she's she's been picking this up um, as Mel previously was dealing with it. Um, uh, so I, th I think I can do a um, w we can get, give a bit of feedback to you directly about how you can get involved, and we can make people aware in this call about how to contribute if they want to uh, actively participate in that. But it, it's we haven't really decided the best the best forum yet. Okay, thanks. Okay, anything else from anyone? Otherwise, I'll, we'll move on to the booking stuff. No? Okay, well, if anything uh, comes up afterwards, then feel free to drop us an email or um, either directly to us or through the mailing list. Okay, so uh, Nick, do you want to lead us through the... Next. Sure. Um, imagine me gesticulating uh, rapidly, and uh, and then you, I won't need to have a camera to to make this work. Uh, so um, uh, what we're planning to do here is perfect. Um, I've taken uh, the content that some of you have seen, and, and, uh, and actually, luckily, some of you are also quite new. So this is actually a pretty good time for you guys, as in terms of joining, um, because we're running through this as a summary. Um, and so you, you will have a really good opportunity now, um, having maybe not been part of, of all of the process or, or be completely new to the process today, um, to uh, jump in and, uh, and just comment and, and, and see what you think. Um, so if you, um, on the left hand side, if you just scroll down the contents, you can see there's, there's a booking flow there, five, broker roll, six, tax, seven, 
uh, model eight and nine booking operations. That's the stuff that I've put in here um, so far. So um, I had a, um, a few questions to ask the group uh, around uh, some of these particular issues, but I think probably um, I'll try and, and leave uh, 10 minutes towards the end just to just do that with those particular points. Um, but then the remainder of the time, we'll just run through this. Um, and um, I see Ian's appeared, uh, which is fantastic. Hi, Ian. Um, so uh, you, you, you may have, uh, have comments on this as well, because we've had, um, we've, we've taken this uh, from the previous conversations and we've, um, we've hopefully included all the feedback. Um, but if there's any additional feedback, of course, love to hear it. Um, so does anyone have any, any questions about this more generally or shall I just get stuck in? Um, nodding is good, let's do that. So, uh, so let's start with four then on the left hand side, key actors. So I'll just take you through this and luckily it's visual. So we're not gonna read very much. I'm just gonna point at diagrams. Um, so this is the, the, the crux of what this booking spec describes between these different roles on the, on, in the screen and in the group today, we've got people representing mainly the broker booking system, uh, uh, sorry, the broker and the booking system roles. Um, and so booking system, Club Spark, Legend, um, uh, Perfect Gym, like you guys are, uh, are providing the seller, which is your customer, with an opportunity to make their information available openly and to make it bookable. Um, and then with the broker side, so that's uh, I'm in and um, my local pitch. Oh, sorry, Clarity. I didn't see you there, Raymond. Sorry, Ray. Um, uh, Clarity is also a booking system. And then with the broker, you've also got um, the opportunity to use that data and, and then present it to the customer. And the customer can make the booking through the broker and the booking system to uh, access uh, the inventory from the seller. So that's, that, that's the main people involved. Uh, key point of that diagram, the payment provider is out of scope. So what those gray arrows represent. So any questions on that basic framing before we move on? Oh, cool. So next then, booking flow. Um, so the user journey, just in, in this, this bit, is a kind of three-step user journey that we're catering for here, which is select, uh, register, login, and book and pay. And generally speaking, everyone goes through that journey. Um, they may already have preset information. So the, uh, so for example, the selection might already be made via voice or otherwise. Um, so you might not have an actual screen to select and registration likewise, you might be logged in. So you might need to actually have a screen. You might have your credit card details already registered. So you might not have a screen for that. Um, but the, inf the information will be required um in any case to go through these steps and so that's the kind of broadly what we've tried to then write the specification around is those three steps and actually having a um, defined user journey hopefully makes it easier for influencers as well to visualize what we're trying to do with the different api calls um, so moving on and through if you interrupt me with anything that um you're thinking as and when um this is the uh, the, the main flow and so after the select stage you can see there that the broker makes a call uh, a checkpoint call to the booking system um, after the register it makes a second checkpoint call and after book and pay it makes a, a call to complete uh, the order so the first of those call, two calls order quote and uh, sorry order quote and checkpoint one and the order quote and checkpoint two basically both of those are just saying this is the stuff I want to buy give me a quote for it and that quote will come back including discounts or tax or anything that might be uh you might not be aware of as a broker um to give you a total amount that needs to be um paid and so you can make an order quote at checkpoint one anonymously without any customer information and you can make an order quote uh call at checkpoint two with customer details um and i'll come on to why you might want to do those in a second um, when you've got both of those uh, done, you don't have to do the first one, uh, but the second one is is mandatory, and that's a change we made because um, there's no other way of knowing how much money to take unless it's free. The only case when it's not mandatory to do the second checkpoint is when it's a free booking and you, you can be sure it's free. 
um, based on the information you have from the open feed. So assuming that it's not free, um, which means there could be tax and all kinds of other things in there, so you have to ask for a price, um, then your order quote will give you back a total price. And that total price can be used with your payment processor to authorize that payment. And then the booking call can be made to say, we've authorized this amount um, and we'd like to complete the booking. The booking call can then succeeds. So there's no shopping basket here. There's no adding things as you go along. You send the complete order with all the items in that book stage. It is then completed and succeeds or fails as one. So if there's any issues with it uh, at all, it will completely fail. And if, if that's the case, you're expected to then um, either allow the authorization of the payment to expire, which it will automatically do, or if you want, if you reverse that, if you're able to do that um, with your payment provider, you can reverse that. Assuming it succeeds, however, you would then complete the, the capture of the payment, um, which is the second of that two-phase commit on the right-hand side, um, which then completes your booking. And so as you can see, it's quite straightforward. There's a quote, put all your items in, and then when you get your total, you make the order, and then you get that completion. So two API calls, two API endpoints, um, and, uh, and an, an optional uh, checkpoint one as well. Um, and so um, you'll see if you just scroll down there a bit, Lee, there, uh, the, the next I've just kind of laid out here, the shoulds and the musts to make that super clear. So C1 is the, is the optional step. You don't have to do that checkpoint. And we'll talk about leasing in a second. Um, and, uh, and C2 and, and B are the uh, mandatory. You must do C2 or B unless it's a free uh, order, in which case you can just do B, that, that booking call. And then on, that's on the booking system side. Uh, sorry, that's on the broker side, on the booking system side. Uh, the booking system must always implement responses for C1, C2 and, and the booking step. So you, without knowing what the broker is going to do, you have to implement all of them. Um, although C1 and C2 can be implemented identically uh, in the simplest case. So it's actually not, not any additional burden there to do that. Um, and so then coming on and covering leasing. Um, so leasing is a uh, straightforward uh, um, thing to do because it's all stateless. So you can, if you, if you want to, optionally, at the point where, and we can probably scroll down to this next diagram to make this clear, it's the same diagram, it's just a, a sequence version of the same. Uh, so at the point where you select or register um, and, you and you make that order quote call to the booking system, the booking system can optionally, at that point, generate a lease to reserve the inventory. Um, it can do it optionally at one with an anonymous lease because you don't have any customer details at this point. It's just someone's clicked on it. You can, you can reserve it there. Or if you want to wait until you've got customer details confirmed, which you might want to do for business or technical reasons, um, then you can wait until C2 and then you can, you can optionally create a lease there. Um, and then that lease is then uh, would then be used because you create a, a, a GUID, a unique identifier at the very beginning of this process. So you use that GUID throughout, which means that when you come to the end to make that booking with the order, with the same GUID you used for the, for the order quote, if there's any leases that need to be resolved to complete that uh, order, you can then do that. Um, and that will mean that you, that you make use of those leases. If the leases have expired or if they weren't created or for any other reason, um, then, then it must con it must attempt to to do to, to complete the order anyway, uh, and then uh, will return um, uh, success, assuming that it can through some um, uh, some some way make those make um, reserve those items and book them. Um, so that's that's the process. Um, does anyone have any questions or ah? Uh, great, thanks Ray. I've got a uh, comment from Ray. Can you expand the broker generates um, session UUID text to specify the UUID should remain consistent throughout the lifetime? Uh, so it's explicit. Yes, absolutely. We'll make that make that change. Um, cool. Does anyone else else have any comments or questions on that? Yeah, Ian has raised his hand. Ah. Oh, I didn't know you could do that. No, I think it's a new feature. It's new to me. Ian? 
Has he knowingly raised his hand is the question. He's still muted, so. Uh, hello, Ian. You're unmuted now. Although no audio. You're not hearing me talk, he says. That is right. Same question, same question as Ray. Uh, okay. Ah, so we're not hearing you, unfortunately, Ian, but uh, great. We can use that, that chat, that chat window works just fine. So um, same question as Ray, brilliant. We'll make that explicit, make it clear that the, the, uh, the UUID gets generated up front and reused throughout. Has anyone else got any questions or comments? Uh, that was an actual hand up from Peter. Is it Pete or Peter, by the way? You're on mute still. Are you still on mute? Oh, there we go. Yeah. There we go. Right. Um, so in this sequence diagram, you've got the broker um, handling the payment themselves. Um, from our perspective as the booking system, part of our revenue model is in that um, in that payment. So we generally take a percentage off each transaction. So how are booking systems like ours going to fit in with this flow? Because this is essentially bypassing ClubSpark in a way. Um, and we've got a whole, I mean, I think uh, from the table of contents, I saw you had some stuff around refunds and cancellations, but um, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering why we've gone with this model as opposed to something like uh, Skyscanner and that which send you off to make the booking on the third party site or even ha how we reconcile those receipts with the booking system at the end. Yeah, brilliant questions. So um, that's there's actually an entire section dedicated to some of this in section six, uh, and which is the, I think the next bit we're coming on to. So that's actually a well placed i might just answer a couple of those things um at the higher level first before we get there though um so um uh why why are, why is payments not being standardized uh is basically because it's quite complicated um and uh there are i mean there's there's stripe and there's others that the different um providers use and there's a there's a marketplace of those obviously available um the scope of this is kind of quite tightly bound to just the booking and so it doesn't try to to, to um, create standards around those payment providers and the other issue of course is that those payment providers are much much bigger and um, we've had had some um, spent some quite a lot of time getting everyone on board to implement these standards uh, and obviously that might then delay the process further um, so there's that there's that aspect and the other aspect is um, so there's a practical point the other aspect is around innovation so there are a number of different business models that can be used uh, across the, the sector around brokers, booking systems, etc., cetera. Um, and this doesn't make any assumptions around um, those business models other than what's laid out in, um, in section six and the kind of highest level contractual obligations and VAT obligations that um, you, you have regardless of the model. Um, and so it's basically a contractual question between the broker, the booking system and the seller um, and the customer to make sure that any payments such as commission payments well, which are absolutely still possible uh, they're just out of band of the of the standard so it, if for example for yourselves if you wanted to ensure that you still have that commission uh, that you you already have built into your business model through this you just need to make sure that that's in the terms and conditions that you uh, provide to any integrator um, that they need to um, they need to, to honor that um, and that that's also in the um, uh, that's just yeah. That's something that you um, agree with everybody that's involved in in the, in the process. So uh, and and the idea is, and it's probably a, a diagram on this in a minute. Uh, that that's that's all handled out of band. So this doesn't actually. There's other commission payments in the system, such as the commission payment the broker might take. There might be a payment processor commission. So Stripe takes a fee. Um, there's a few others of those. None of those are in scope of this, um, and they're all handled separately. Um, and that means that the the most efficient way of doing that, however that is, depending on the payment provider, um, can be used. I think isn't it also the case that this doesn't um, cut out the business model where the booking system takes a um, commission on the payment as well, because that's just handled um, uh, independently. So the case where where ClubSpark take um, a percent of the payment can still be done uh, as well as integrating 
using this system. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, it, yeah. We, we'll have to have a look if this is going to be feasible, I think, for, for Clubspark, because, I mean, our, the, the most simple scenario is just that commission that Clubspark takes, but we've actually got um, some payment scenarios where we collect, you know, we might collect £15, for example, Clubspark gets one pound of it, Stripe gets another pound of it, the, the club that's um, offering service gets a certain amount, the NGO gets a certain amount, so there, there's a whole lot of reconciling and then when you do rollbacks and refunds and stuff, um, I mean, yeah, we, we may be able to handle that, but it, when I said before um, about sending, you know, um, Skyscanner and others where they actually send you off to the booking system to place the booking or to, to make the payment. So that, that wouldn't necessarily require standardising with Stripe or PayPal or anyone like that. That would just require a, a standard booking flow, I guess, from any broker can send a request to a, um, to a booking system in a certain format and the booking system would process the payment at that point is what yes. I was thinking. Sorry, I didn't answer that bit of the question. So, um, and that's that's related to innovation again. So, um, there are scenarios where sending someone into an iframe might work, um, but there are also so to give you some examples of business models here. There's you or and 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 ideas that are and and apps that are in existence. So you know, there's there's booking as a seamless journey through an app or or watch or voice commands and all that kind of that kind of genre of stuff. Um, there's also uh, the idea that some uh, brokers actually pay for so um, one sports brand offered to pay for um, all of, all uh, of a certain um, uh, demographics activities, and so they would actually fund that. There's also employee wellness where the employer pays, and then the employer pays, so it's free for the end user, but the employer then selects. And there's employee wellness is a huge thing, and there's lots of different people looking at that. So um, basically, any any time where the business model is is not as straightforward as just this is a signpost to a booking page as you say um is when that would be useful so the whole point of this is to maximize the scope for innovation uh, and ensure that anyone can yeah do whatever is necessary um mm. if if an eye iframe embed isn't uh, isn't possible or that doesn't make sense um but yes yeah, uh, so. I, I think this is going to require a lot of uh, a lot of business and contractual agreements to uh so certain partners to get on board with this then I think from the sounds of things because you're, you, it sounds like you're relying on um, the, the standard that the systems work together but then you're relying on the contract to reconcile um, is what I'm understanding. Uh, ultimately I mean yeah uh, we, you, you, we're not standardizing the reconciliation but without so we, we should probably pick this up separately actually because that but it's a, we can definitely do that um, I just want to mention a couple of quick points from um, Ian and Ray on the on the call so Ian said uh, uh, there are PCI uh, challenges with sending people from your site to an iframe on another site um, you can in theory capture card details from your app and uh, Ray's um, reiterating from a previous call the primary reason for the API uh, side was to allow many customer journeys without defining the platform and so that's yes. hopefully helpful but let's but yeah let's definitely pick that up because i know that you're um keen to get moving on this and um um so yeah that's so that stuff's not included, included in the standard but it certainly is part of the, the ecosystem of course everyone needs to make money um so that's important uh, just, just, a minor, just an added minor point there's a while the um the payment processing here was shown as a separate system it's like to be in most flows, there's no reason why a booking system couldn't offer a payment mechanism. It's just that's not going to be standardized within this spec. That's true. Yeah, that's true. So you'd see the brokers as that being a kind of responsibility if the broker wants to make payments for, say, Clubspark, then they'd have to integrate with the Clubspark approved payment processor. So, if that was part uh, of the you know, as part of people giving people access to the rest of the API, then, then yes, I guess so. Yeah, that's definitely yeah. a route. Again, I, I, so I know Stripe Connect offers some things in that area already. We just yeah. worth looking at that. Um, and that's all, but yeah, anyway, that's so that's useful, useful discussion. Um, let's pick that up separately. Um, so moving through this, then, if we go to the next, if you scroll down, thanks though for that, Pete. That was really uh, useful to. 
make sure everyone's on the same page with. Is there a specific um, reference you want to show me? No, if you sure? keep going through this, this is basically just a text explaining what I've just explained there. So um, the next bit of this is just talking about the roles of the different uh, the broker roles, which is kind of a little bit related to what we just discussed there. But um, this was from uh, a few calls ago, we talked about this. Um, so there are contractual relationships involved. Uh, there's a there's a couple of, of models which are recognized in terms of VAT and other things um, as the way that this can work. And then both are in use, both primary models are in use in the sector already. Pay as you gym is an example of this one. Uh, so the reseller broker model is one where the uh, innovator or the sorry, the app um, or the the, the um, broker that they actually purchase the squash court or the yoga class or whatever it is ahead of time, uh, which might only be by a few seconds or milliseconds, um, but they purchase it, they own it, and then they resell it onto the customer. And there are benefits in doing that. You might want to, uh, a bit like with theatre, you might want to reserve uh, a particular set of um, uh, I don't know, uh, pitches or you might want to um, reserve a number of spaces on the class if you're booking in your Weight Watchers group, for example, into and, and you want to have a number of spaces available, you might book 10 of them into a class at once and then you might get people to sign up to that, but you've paid for the 10 up front. Um, and so there's there's scenarios where this could is, is useful. Um, and the specific thing that's worth pointing out here is for taxation purposes, uh, it's a business and business transaction between the reseller uh, and the seller. And so they purchase as a business those yoga class spots and then they then um, sell them to the, the customer and what this means if you scroll down slightly to look at the wording underneath um, is that if um, the seller ha is a VAT exempt eligible body um, for B2C transactions that actually for this in this case you wouldn't get that exemption um, because you're not selling to the customer directly or selling via the reseller and that has implications on for trusts and for others um, that um, are interested in that. And so uh, that's the one route, and that's largely untouched from the, the, the conversations we've had previously on this subject. So um, um, we can talk about that if anyone's got some questions after that. I just cover the agent broker, which is the other route. So if you go down a bit further, um, the agent broker diagram shows that in the agent broker relationship, um, the customer and, and the seller has a, have a direct contractual relationship and all the agent broker really is doing in there is just facilitating that and obviously the booking system's in there somewhere and um, and a bit to, like, to, to your previous point Peter, the, the grey arrows here, the external contractual relationship, the internal contractual relationship which might well represent commission payments and other things that are happening there um, and likewise those arrows exist for um, for booking uh, sorry for booking systems as well if if there was a commission involved there or or whatever else um but they're actually out of scope of this so what we're really just talking about for this spec is the relationship between the customer and the seller um and so that is the total amount that the uh yoga class is worth so 10 pounds um that the customer is purchasing for 10 pounds and it might be that there's some uh booking fees and other things going on in that but that doesn't from a vat perspective uh, that's separate and outside of that contractual relationship should, so should be handled separately. The focus of this is actually just to enable uh, that one transaction. So £10 uh, uh, squash court, you would then uh, sell to the customer for £10 uh, and the, the VAT on that would be whatever it is um, separate to the booking fees. Um, it's, it's worth mentioning that uh, in some cases um, it's it's uh, there are there are reasons from a um, business model point of view where you might want to adjust the price variable pricing um, and so you you are able to override the price um, uh, as an as an agent broker um, you're able to override the price the seller is selling for but the seller would then still um, complete the, the tax calculations as they previously um, would just assuming that the, a different price for their inventory um, and that allows for um, more interesting pricing um, so business models to to um, to be um, experimented with without too much additional work for anyone else involved, um, which is kind of the idea behind that. So that's the agent broker. And then finally, there's the no broker, which is a very straightforward, the customer buys from the seller. And this is in a situation where you might just be, it might just be the website of the, um, 
uh, of the customer of the booking system, for example. Um, so the seller's own website. And in the, if it's the seller's own website, they, they probably, uh, they don't have an agent um, broker or a reseller broker. They are their own broker, in which case they're no broker. Um, and that just means that the, um, the customer is the customer and the seller is the seller. So it doesn't imply anything else. Um, and so with the agent broker, um, the customer is who the VAT receipt is created for. With the reseller, it's the, uh, it's the reseller broker which, who the VAT receipt is created for. That's the, the main difference between the two. Um, and and that takes us on to the next bit. So is anyone any questions on that before we move on to the next bit? Great, okay. Uh, so the tax, the next bit then is tax receipts. Um, and so this is uh, basically saying that the, um, in order to ensure that there are, there is um, maximum scope for the various business models that exist, including move credits. And um, we talked about employee wellness before. There's all kinds of ways. There's loads of scenarios where the amount of money being paid from the uh, customer to the seller isn't actually, uh, isn't cash but is still uh, VAT exempt. Um, and so you can, use, you can use some form of credits to do that. ClassPass does it, MoveGB does it, others do it. Um, and the reason you want to do that is that you get the VAT exemption um, for everyone involved. You just don't um, need to worry about um, the customer paying. They can pay on using a subscription model or other model to do that. And so for that reason, tax receipts being sent directly from the booking system is not advised. Um, because that could create confusion around the, whatever totals are being put into the booking system versus what the customer is seeing as move credits or whatever the conversion rate is between the credit system uh, and the and the actual cash amount. And so um, instead of that, what what this is uh, is mandating here is that the booking system must not send receipts directly to the customer for agent broker or reseller broker bookings. Um, it actually doesn't make sense for a reseller broker anyway because the customer is the um, is the reseller broker. Um, uh, and to ensure that, that everyone is, is complying with the law, if you are an agent broker or you're a reseller broker, you have an obligation in this spec to send a, a, a VAT receipt, which says either send a VAT receipt to the customer or allow the customer to easily retrieve a full tax receipt at any future date, um, which basically means that you ensure that everybody is compliant because you provide either one of those um, acceptable routes to retrieve that information. Um, and that can be retrieved through um, the agent broker or through the reseller broker. So i.e. the experience that the customer used to make the booking is the same place that they go and find the receipt or the same place they expect to be sent the receipt from. Um, also is mandating here that the tax receipt sent must comply with any legal requirements. Um, so obviously it's on the um, broker to ensure that they, um, they comply with that, um, which, and then this obviously, Technically, we can say all of this, of course, but it's going to come down to people being comfortable with the organizations they're working with on the ground as to who works with who and who's actually got all of this stuff shored up and, and is, is complying properly. Um, and so, of course, that's where um, it's, uh, it's the case that the, um, the, 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 the spec is just talking about the technical side rather than talking about any other contractual implications. Um, as we discussed last time, uh, I know Ian and Ray had some um, very clear views on this. Um, hopefully it's been reflected here um, that B2, B2C tax calculation is mandatory by the booking system. And so there's no scenario here where the agent broker or any broker tries to make any tax calculation. That tax calculation is done by the booking system and is and those totals are sent over with the quote. Um, and that's what's used. Um, however, in the case where there's an organization making a booking, I think this is what came out of the last call, there are scenarios where either an organization makes a booking, um, so uh, a business might make a booking for their company to you know, have a bunch of people go to, go to a yoga class, use the yoga example again, they might have a bunch of employees going there, the business therefore might be making the booking rather than the, the employee themselves, assuming there's no credit system in place, in which case they would need to be considered uh, under whatever B2B tax calculations uh, are relevant. And the same is the case of the reseller broker, which is itself an organization. Uh, and in both of these scenarios, um, 
uh, it is an organization and I think um, uh, Ray and um, Ian uh, who are both muted uh, both uh, very very strongly suggested that having organization uh, uh, so B2B to B2B tax calculations built into the booking system was a step too far at this stage certainly and was going to be incredibly complicated and so rather than ruling out that scenario completely because there are likely to be um, still people that want to create that type of experience um, the, the spec just says basically if you are in a situation where it's an organization that is specified as a customer which is either of those two scenarios um, that the tax calculation just is just not included um, and so that's explicitly saying don't do the tax calculation um, if you're an organization and at the, in the future we might talk about ways that it would make sense to have that calculation happen within the spec um, such as providing organizational details including the country of origin and all sorts of things which allow you to make that calculation accurately um, for now and according to what at least what i've seen of the the hmrc guidance it's okay to reconcile that stuff out of band if you need to as long as it gets reconciled somewhere and so if someone wanted to crack on and do that um, they would be able to to do that reconciliation separately and they could they deal with all the stuff manually which from what I've understood from the last call is actually what already happens a lot of manual work is going on behind the scenes um, with these business to business transactions at the moment um, and so basically we can replicate the manual system if needed if anyone wants to do that um, so rather than saying it's not possible it just says it is it, that's the way of doing it um, I think it might be worth making that that particular point a bit clearer in the current text. So, you know, the reason why we're saying it is optional is basically decided not to get into specifying B two B tax calculations. Yeah. I don't I don't think it's quite clear that that is a kind of design decision or a point in time decision here, and it might change in future. Cool. Yeah. Put that, that, that as a note. Perfect. Um, uh, does anybody have um, any thoughts on that? And uh, Ray and Ian, would you mind passing a thumbs up or some something positive over the group chat if that's roughly what we talked about before and you're you're happy or uh, something like that? Okay. Uh, Ian's going to have a read of it at some point. And uh, and we'll reply offline. Um, Ray, Ray, is it vaguely what you were expecting? And anyone else actually? Is any, does anyone else have any thoughts on this? I uh, know from an agent's perspective that will make sense and it's good. Cool. Okay. Um, great. And. Um, and I'll wait for Ray's reply. He might just be typing something. Um, and then the other thing that we talked about was tax mode. And this is something that um, I know that Ray was quite keen on specifically. This is that the, uh, the tax mode can actually be based in net or gross. And there's two ways of doing that. Um, and my suggestion here was to do that at the order level. So actually allowing for um, the, 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 the whole system to be one or the other, but only doing that on an order by order basis, um, which is probably the um, the highest level of granularity available really, because we can't do it, we could do it system by system, but doesn't really exist when you've got lots of different brokers involved and lots of different booking systems. So order by order means that at least everything within that order is consistent. Um, uh, is this mandatory? Sorry, and was that, is what mandatory? The tax mode? Ah. Uh, I believe it's the booking system that specifies. I'll make that clearer. Uh, the booking system specifies the tax mode. Um, so if you wanted to set it to whatever were your um, system uses. Uh, must be the order or the offer. That's a really good point. It must be the S. Yes. Okay, right. Uh, 
Okay, fantastic point from Silent Ian. Uh, I will have a, we've only got a few minutes left of this call. Um, um, <laughs> that's brilliant. I will have a look at that. You're totally right because it needs to be consistent with the offer. And I'm not sure how we're gonna reconcile that. So I'll check that. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, great. So running to the next bit of this then. So order operations, just to uh, finish off section nine and hopefully in time. Um, then these, these uh, couple of questions will come out. So um, this, these are about um, making amendments to the, uh, to the uh, quote. So this is just a, a point that if people change what's in their shopping basket as they move through, um, that you just, you just keep calling order quote and every time you call it with something different, um, there's an expectation that that will update the leases accordingly. And so as the same um, UUID, but with different contents in the basket and every time it will then uh, update the um the leases and give you a new total including tax and discounts and anything else that's relevant um so that's pretty as straightforward as that basically c call c1 and c2 until you're ready to make the booking um and then amending the order after it's been created uh, what about when the item has been removed from the basket? When an item has been removed from the basket, you just make the call. Uh, sorry, if you scroll up again, uh, Lee, 9.1. Um, when the item is removed from the basket, you're just making the call to C1, which includes all of those items. So every time you make the call, you include the whole basket. Uh, mark things as discarded. But I think on the server side you could do that, but I think from the for consistency rather than adding a kind of removed status to the order quote, it would be simpler if you just didn't include them in the responses. Uh, yeah. Okay. So there's a question about. Um, so there's there's a there's an overhead to to doing that, but presumably that's. I imagine that's just you would have to do a diff from what you're being given to what you you already have in the basket and just remove the things that, that don't exist. Um, okay, should be okay. Great. Nick, um, in 1.1, 1 .1, there's a section that says a number of additional requirements that relate to the booking of events and facilities are currently out of scope. And the third point there is handling bookings for multiple events with shopping carts. That's a good point. Um, so we, we, the reason we started including this stuff is to make sure that the, the plan that we had actually worked for that scenario. Um, it's a good point about how much of this we then include in this spec versus not on the basis of the scope. Um, but certainly one of the issues we hit on earlier on in the process was that we hadn't done enough thinking about that scenario and that actually radically changed the design. And so uh, that's why it's ended up where it is. So uh, are, are baskets and shopping carts the same thing or are they different things? Uh, the same thing, baskets and shopping carts. Um, so should that line be in there? Good question. Good question. Uh, I'll, let me pick that up with Lee. Um, shopping cart line in scope. Okay, I'll, I will pick that up. Um, just in terms of, sorry to um, crack, crack on, but that's, if that's okay. Um, Perfect. Um, so just to finish off these last two bits then, um, that's a really good point to make. Um, amending the order after it's been created. So if we're, if we need to make any changes to what's in the, in the basket as it were, or if there's only one allowed uh, in the basket, as, as might be the case depending on the scope, uh, then making changes to that one item, which might be rebooking it or, or rescheduling it to a different day. Um, the amending the order after it's been booked is a process of basically quite similar to the other um, process of making the original booking. All you do is you do uh, an order quote uh, with the same UUID, although this time that UUID will of course have been uh, actually exist as a booking. Um, and that order quote has in it the, um, the, the changes that you'd like to make to the booking. So it's just, it's just got the, the order items, the difference. And then when that quote comes back, that quote will come back with the total of payment due exactly as it would have for a fresh booking um, with that new uh, basket recognized there. And so that's basically saying, assuming I process these, these removing these things and adding these things, this is what it'll come back to. Um, 
And the difference is that it also comes back with, um, and um, we might not have time to cover the uh, amount, but uh, it also comes back with the amount of money, the total payment due uh, for that. And underneath it has, to semi answer Ian's question, um, the uh, transaction, a list of transactions. Um, and I've just realized I haven't got it on this screen. So I would have to switch screens to show you that. But effectively, if you um, imagine a, an array of transactions where each transaction is a payment or a, um, a refund. So an array of transactions where each transaction is a payment or a refund. Um, it would come back with the payment that's already been made in that array. And so you could look at the total from the transaction array, which is totaling payments and refunds. Um, and you could compare that to the total payment due and then say, okay, well, I need to then either we need additional, additional payment or a refund to be made in order to, that the, the transaction array total is equal to the total payment due. Um, and do we include the unchanged? Yes, in the amended order, the unchanged bookings are included. Um, and part of the reason for that is it's actually VAT reasons. Um, so the way that you would, um, when you create, an, there's, there's a few ways of doing VAT receipts, but um, the way that would fit most consistently with this approach is to actually um, void the previous VAT receipt and issue a new one. Um, and what that means is that um, if you change anything in that, in the, in that basket, and then you um, make a payment uh, as is required. You might not need a payment if it's the same price. You might just be able to make the change without needing to change the transaction array. Um, then uh, when, you, when you've done that, that will create a new uh, invoice. Um, and, and that's what this bit at the bottom there says. It just increments the invoice number to reflect that a change has been made. So there was an old invoice which was embedded in the previous version, but there's a new um, invoice. Um, doing uh I, I believe so and ian saying do we include uh the change the date has changed or uh yes yeah, so so the idea is that you issue a new uh, invoice and there's a question of not sure if we can void it i believe you can uh, certainly what the hmrc website says but we'll do, we'll get additional guidance to check that that's the case um, because uh, the, there's two approaches that they recommend. Um, either you either you issue a credit, um, and then you use that credit to pay for the next thing, uh, or you issue a, uh, um, a replacement. They call it a replacement receipt, and the replacement receipt. Um, yes, but mark the change type. So, um, we're we're almost out of time, and I we were in kind of a bit of a detail from one bit i'm wondering whether we should just take discussion of this offline yeah 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 so that we can we can definitely do that clarity lives just said that they issue a full credit and reinvoice so that's interesting which seems uh, i was gonna say can i just add my one bit of the call uh the way most systems are moving especially from the cloud-based front is that voiding which effectively deletes stuff and makes it disappear no longer exists uh, and effectively it's a refund and then a new transaction new id new new vat transaction that's then traceable in any audit so i think the term void probably needs to not be included in any payment based referencing at the moment because it will disappear as all of the various vat systems around europe start to move into that level of audit so in but you're saying you do issue a replacement vat receipt you, it's a new transaction basically you have to have a transaction flow so if you sell something we'll call it transaction a you can't just void it and make transaction a disappear and produce transaction b you've got to have a step in your audit trail for that purposes that shows what happened to transaction a otherwise it's an easy way of removing money from a business and taking the cash so a lot of audit compliance on this stuff is moving towards having a chain of transactions even for what you're calling a void so it effectively acts like a return sale in most pos systems Brilliant. So in, in this case, as long as the previous invoice is maintained by the booking system so that it was able to be traced back and, and it was considered to be, maybe void is the wrong word, but replaced. It's a return, basically. Yeah, void, void is a term that's pretty much disappearing from all point of sale systems, not just related to fitness booking. So return uh, is reason. Do we want the word of return instead? It probably makes more sense 
than using a uh, void because void suggests deleting it and just taking it out of the system forever. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's also worth noting that the, that the decision to allow for multiple item orders is a little complexity here because otherwise, presumably, it would just be as simple as cancelling an order. So the complexity here is about when your partial cancellation at least the following. Yes, although cancelling and recreating an order, I suppose, is the same as updating an order. If that's, I suppose, that's the, that's the, the discussion here, isn't it? Um, yeah. So if you fully I think that would possibly make things a lot simpler if we didn't support amending an order after it's been made. We just had a cancellation or refund process, um, yeah. and then there's just a new order. There's no extra complexity around amending something because um, it's just a normal cancellation. Yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not, maybe it was in before and I hadn't really internalised it, but I think previously it was about cancelling whole orders rather than requirement for partial cancellation. So if we only implemented whole order cancellation at the moment, this would get much simpler. Okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. And that would be consistent with what Nathan's saying as well, because you're cancelling everything and then creating a new, and also what Ray's saying, uh, issue full credit and re-invoice. Um, so so as assuming that we're always using um, payment um, providers that allow you to do that, um, that does that does make sense. Well, I suppose that, yeah, the payment's out of band anyway, so I suppose you could reuse the same payment. Um, maybe you, actually, no, you couldn't. Um, okay, uh, that's helpful. Uh, full reinvoice is always much simpler, says Ray. Great, let's do the full full reinvoice. Um, yeah, my well, only concern there is, is, is do we, does that mean that we have to refund and re, uh, the consumer needs to put the credit card details in again, basically. But they could be saved, I suppose, in the system, so maybe that's not a big deal. Okay, all right, fine. So that sounds good. So we'll simplify this section to uh, full invoice, uh, full cancellation and refund process. Um, yeah. um, one, one thing on that, um, we do also, uh, Cobbs Park at least supports partial refunds as well. So I think if this was just split into or changed to just be full cancellations and partial refunds, um, I think that would suffice. I don't think we need a, an amending. So you can only, so okay, so you can only remove things that are in there or cancel the whole thing. So it's only removals that are available. We could easily make yeah, that. Yeah, basically. Okay. Well, that's fine. We can so I'll just simplify 9.2 to allow only re remove and refund. Um, right. Partial refunds aren't always associated with removals. They may just be, um, you know, perhaps the, the experience wasn't good and there's a goodwill partial refund of £10 or something. So um, I don't think that necessarily needs to be tied to the order, just that there is a, a way, a, a mechanism to do partial and full refunds. Oh, so you were saying that way to... does the total for the refunds need to tally with the total for the total payment due? Or are you saying no, just allow yeah, arbitrary refunds? Not, not currently for Cogspark at least. Um, I think if refunds and cancellations are separate to the order um, and then you just have the ability to cancel an order and issue a new order, um, I think that would remove some of the complexity around the different scenarios that can go on between the two. Okay, okay, I'll have a look at that. Um, so Nick, um, so to allow uh, other people to kind of digest this in more detail, at what point, um, I'm going to serve as in the URL anyway, but at what point are we going to circulate the document for review? So I, I'll, I'll clean up the bits we've talked about um, and I've got, a, I've got a little, a few more bits to this section to add. Um, and uh, I, I suspect probably by the end of the week we'll be able to circulate it. That's what I'll, I'll aim, to, hopefully sooner. Um, the other, the only other two bits I was going to cover were just this, um, um, which I might just, if I just spend one minute on this, maybe if, if, if everyone has time, if you don't, don't feel free to run away if you, if you haven't, but, um, if you just go to 9.4 there, Lee, um, this is specifically interesting because it's about the, uh, uh, the feed. So there's a, there's an RPDE feed of, um, orders. And the idea is that every, every time there's an order made, that feed gets added to with additional orders. 
and that just means that you can poll for those orders. And there's two states particularly that are specified here um, that, um, that that order can come through in. The first state is the um, broker refund requested state. If it's in that state, then you have to basically do the refund as a broker. Um, and, uh, and that means that's assuming that someone in the booking system side has cancelled it and requested a refund. The broker then has to process that refund, um, which I'll amend to include the same detail as we've just discussed for um, customer um, triggered refunds. And then um, if you go slightly further down, the other state it can be in is just a, a order complete state. Um, and if it's in the order complete state, um, that's where um, you, you get your um, well, actually, this was this was actually talking about getting additional um, a new invoice if there's been any changes made. Um, but this is where, a, if you wanted to create a co consistently trigger emails off of new orders that have been created, you could use this to do that. Um, and uh, so that's the last two bits. Does anyone have any quick thoughts on that, on either of those as a an approach? You're um, muted, Peter. PC and muted if you're. Can I just confirm that um, this is specific to the broker this feed? So broker one wouldn't see broker two's orders coming through, they'd only see their own? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll to, to give you a bit of context, that we ended up at going with this route after discussing options to do some kind of out of hand notifications between the booking system and the broker we just using webhooks but the overall feeling was that would add a bunch of complexity and or issues so we've gone with a rpd feed because it builds on some of the other work people felt comfortable about building that so if a business works with more than one broker they will have more than one feed yes that's right one one feed per broker and I'm assuming that there's authentication because I know the previous work I did with you, I can see there's an API authentication in 10.4 actually. Um, yeah, that's right. Uh, it's not it's not actually included the uh, specifically how the authentication is. Um, that's, that's not part of the spec, uh, but, but yes, it would be authenticated. Made that clear as well. Yeah. Um, uh, I haven't seen what's in 10.4.10 yet, but perhaps a listing of exactly which behaviour is possible unauthentication, uh, sorry, unauthenticated, and which behaviours require authentication as well. Where everything is authenticated. The entire feed, the entire spec is authenticated. Um, just the okay. open well, spec that is, makes it easy then. Yeah. <laughs> the open spec is open. This is, uh, this is all uh, secure. Um, Okay, so anyone else have any other thoughts on that approach, feeds? Uh, so the, uh, the RPD feed, I suppose that will be um, parameterized with uh, customer identification of some kind. Identity. Yes, that's right. Which this spec should probably include details of. It could also potentially be done by the authentication if you're creating a, an authentication token for each broker and in theory you can just check which tokens are being used yeah actually that's a that's probably a better a better shout isn't it that's probably the way to do it yeah we might want to note in the spec that if somebody does uh, generate her broker um, urls or use a parameter for it that they should be tokens that you couldn't guess some of the some other brokers endpoint. Mm. Security. Although I guess we're going to need to have discovery on these somehow. So there's a good question there as well. Okay. Um, okay. I, I know I need to go to another meeting, so I'm going to have to. Uh, I think I think that's a good thing to do, Lee. Uh, so we, we're, it seems like we're ever closer. Uh, we're not quite there. There's a few little bits to wrap up at the end, uh, but um, that they were the main the main points. So I, I, I'm hopefully, but when I circulate the version, including those comments, uh, that you will um, be, be in a good position to um, to raise anything further. And then I guess we can use the next call, Lee, to um, just answer any final questions on this.
Yeah, that, that was the plan. Uh, if I just look back to my slides, what I was proposing is next call, which will be the 30th final booking spec comments so that we can wrap up this bit of work. And then looking ahead for February, we'd be able to um, think about some of the other other requirements that we've had from this community, uh, which will probably be returning to look at the data model spec, um, depending on where we get to. Um, so yeah, so we'll try and get this editor's draft out by the end of the week, and I'll give everyone roughly two weeks to digest. Um, just as a quick, uh, a quick bit of feedback, um, how do people feel about the kind of uh, number of examples in the document? Would having more sequence diagrams, more uh, example uh, JSON payloads, etc., littered throughout, make it easier to interpret? Um, more examples is always good in my book. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. More more JSON examples are uh, better. Okay. Okay, that sounds good. That's something that Nick and I can work on. Yeah. All right. Um, I think that's it there for today. Um, so I'll wind us up. So thanks again for uh, spending a chunk of your afternoon uh, helping us review this document. Uh, it's really useful and important work. Uh, and I really appreciate the time you'll spend on it. So uh, we'll uh, share the document at the end of the week. I'll circulate the slides afterwards um, and hopefully speak to you all in a couple of weeks. Great, okay. thank you very much. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Thank Cheers, you. Cheers, sir. Bye. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank